Good morning, and welcome to the first of what we hope to be a series of YouTube liturgies, so that those of you who are best not to come out, or those of us who know we have to stay isolated from one another during this time, can pray the liturgy of the Episcopal Church. This is the worship service of the fourth Sunday of Lent. If you have a prayer book at home, you can follow along and I'll be giving out prayer book numbers. If you have the scripture inserts or have access to them online, you can always pause and go and download them and then come, or I can actually give you the Bible citations and if you have a Bible at home, feel free to follow. This is a new experience for me. I know I'm going to be making mistakes, so please patiently bear with me and pray. Let me also say that as we pray this morning, um, I am keeping in prayer the people on our parish prayer list, um, first of all and foremost, for all the doctors, nurses, the medical staff who are working in the fields at this time of great danger. I'm praying for our governmental leaders and the decisions that they have to make for us, praying for that wisdom. Praying for Michael and Catherine Harris, for Claudia Nero, for Lauren Ross Johnson, for strength for her family, for Alex Ellen, for our Bill Deichler, Linda and Daryl Baker, for the continuing recovery of Ellis Thompson, and for the Kakulo family who have experienced a tragedy and death in their family. And pray for those that I don't know of, members of your family or friends, the all who need God's prayers, and for another perspective, a little joy, we pray in thanksgiving for the birthdays of Addison Ross Joyner and Debbie Noberto that will take place during this week. For those of you who have a prayer book, we begin our service on page 267. And for everyone else, just simply pray with me and participate simply by observing. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us we have not been true to the mind of Christ, and we have grieved your Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. We confess our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of others, our anger at our own frustration, our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts, our dishonesty in daily life and work our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, for all false judgments, uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors, and for prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us, for our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Restore us, good Lord, let your anger depart from us, favorably hear us, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in all the world. And by the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, bring us with your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of sinners, but rather that they may turn from their wickedness and live, he has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and with sincere hearts believe his holy gospel. Therefore, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do on this day, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
The first reading this morning is taken from the first book of the prophet Samuel. It is chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling and saying, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, come with me to the sacrifice. So he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord told Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or the height of his stature. I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see humans as they see them. They look at outward appearances, the Lord looks into the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. He then said, Are all your sons here? And he responded, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. Samuel told Jesse, Send and bring him, for he will not, we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and left to go to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm response for this morning, by beautifully, is the 23rd Psalm. Let us pray. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul. He guides me along right pathways for his namesake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread the table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It is chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel passage this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. John. It is chapter 9 the first 41 verses. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who has sinned, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. 
As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground, made mud with saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes and told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. Neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it is he. Others were saying, no, it is someone who looks like him. But he kept saying, I am that man. But they kept asking him, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And I went and I washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees this man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And those Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he told them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, now I see. Some of those Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And he said, he's a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called his parents. And they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that he is our son. We know that he was born blind. We do not know how it is he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. Now the parents had said this because they were afraid, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore the parents said, he is of age, ask him. For the second time they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. One thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become this man's disciples? They reviled him, saying, you are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is astonishing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born entirely in sin and you're trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that the man had been driven out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, sir, who is he? Tell me that I may believe in him. And Jesus responded, you have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. And the man said, Lord, I believe. He worshiped Jesus. And Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Now some Pharisees near him heard this and they said, surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus told them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be a little difficult preaching, but I want to communicate something of my own reflection on this very powerful Gospel, this very powerful message. It's a message of hope and it's a message of challenge. Um, and if you take nothing else, take the words of Amazing Grace and sing them aloud. 
I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I had a professor named Father René Latourelle in the first year, and he said this chapter of John's Gospel was the gospel within the gospel. It's the kernel of every person's encounter with Jesus. And I want to share that with you in sort of a four-act play, and I'll probably do it in my own sort of snarky way that I've been told. But think about it and reflect about it. Jesus sees a blind man who apparently is surviving by begging. We've seen, if you go to religious shrines, you see people who do that to this very day. So what does he do? He heals the man. He makes mud, puts it on his eyes, sends him to a pool to wash his face. The pool's name is Siloam, which in Hebrew means sent. So the irony, he sends a man to a place called sent because eventually he's going to send him out again to be his witness, as he will do with us. And once the man is healed, now his problems start. It's a matter of, be careful what you pray for, you might get it. People are arguing with him. Is it really you? Were you really blind? Who did this to you? And who is the person and where is he? And he's saying, yes, it's me, I was. I don't know, leave me alone. He can see with his eyes. He does not yet have the faith to see with his heart and with his soul. He doesn't know who has sent him to sent so that he can be sent again. And so are we, we who have been baptized into Christ. We are washed in water anointed in the spirit, and we've been sent to pray and to work and to minister for the needs of others, to love others as Christ has loved us. He sends us to those who are hungry and sick and lost and lonely, and there will be plenty of those people who will be among us and with us, and we will become one of them as this disease that we're all dealing with progresses. We've been sent with mud in our eyes because life can be so messy. Families can be messy. My personal life can be messy. Work can be messy. The world, God knows, is messy. And he challenges us to live into our baptism and clean up our lives, respond to his grace, let the waters of baptism truly wash us so that we can be sent to heal others. Act two of this four-act play, the religious establishment, they give the man a hard time. It's a hostile interrogation. They give him the third degree. How have you received your sight? You've been healed, but you've been healed on the Sabbath. It's a holy day. And while healing is good, healing on a holy day is bad. And these guys are the holy day priests, the police. So the man simply says, look, I think he's a prophet. I think he speaks God's message. He's a healer with a message. And Jesus is a healer with a message. He did teach an ethical message on how we should live and how we should care for those in need about loving our enemies and loving one another as much as Jesus himself has loved us. It's a high moral teaching. But if it's only a teaching, it can be unrealistic. And if it's only a teaching, it can be ignored. So then they kind of drag him into a more formal court setting. They intimidate him. They say to him, we know this guy's a sinner. And the response is beautiful. Well, I don't know. I just know that I was blind and now I can see. He must be from God if these things are happening. And now the stakes are really raised. He's more than just a religious teacher. Jesus is now someone who is the messenger from God himself. And while you can dismiss any teacher, any ethical teacher, anyone who raises our consciousness and makes us or challenges us to be more at one with God, you can blow them off if you want to. But if you really believe in your heart of hearts this person speaks God's word, you find it more difficult and unsettling to try to blow that person off. Because the words of that person are no longer the wishes of a dreamer they're the command of our Creator. And then finally, in this very unique, wonderful setting, Jesus reappears, after being missing for most of this. He reappears after much has happened, kind of like in our lives, when we think, where is God when all this is going on around us? The man's been expelled, he's been made fun of, he has been excommunicated from his religious community. So what does Jesus do? He does what he always does, he asks questions. And he asked him the question, do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, who is he that I can believe? And then the powerful words, you have seen him. It's more than physical sight, obviously. This man has to finally learn that Jesus is not only God's messenger, Jesus is God's message. He is the Word incarnate. He is God with us. And now he can see Jesus with the eyes of faith. He can see Jesus as the light of the world. And I hope you will as well, in your prayer and in your reflection, 
When we see Christ clearly, yes, he is the sender and the prophet and the messenger, but he is God. And when we understand that and see it, we are changed. And when we can see the world clearly, we know we are called to change that muddy, messy world. So my prayer is very simple. Lord, as we begin the journey, help us to see. Now, for those who are following in the Book of Common Prayer, I'm going to ask you to please turn to page 358. And for those of you who have the creed memorized, together let us profess what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father through whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and by the power of the Holy Spirit became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May the Lord's peace be with each of you. Be at peace. Pray for me as well. And now we will continue into the liturgy of the table. I'm much aware of the fact you will not be able to see the chalice and patent in front of you. We're going to work on this in the coming weeks as we perfect this liturgy. But right now, use your imagination. There is a small cup, a small plate, a small piece of Eucharistic bread. And we're going to continue with the liturgy of the table. For those of you who have a prayer book, turn to page 340. It is the second Eucharistic prayer. It is within right one of our traditional liturgical language. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was in every way tempted as we are, yet did not sin, by whose grace we are able to triumph over every evil, to live no longer unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, ever praising thee and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, O Lord our God, for that thou didst create heaven and earth and didst make of thine, us in thine own image and of thy tender mercy to give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full and perfect sacrifice for the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. From the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to thee, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. 
Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, we thy people do celebrate and make with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again with power and great glory. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and with thy word and Holy Spirit, to bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be unto us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, whereby we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies. Grant, we beseech thee, that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and also that we and thy whole church may be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And together let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, grant us mercy. Peace. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Father, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and drink his blood, we may ever dwell, evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen the gifts of God for the people of God, taking them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Our final prayer this morning, before we leave, is found on page 111 for those of you who have a Book of Common Prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, kindle within us the fire of love, that by its cleansing flame we may be pure, purged of our sin and made worthy to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God Almighty bless each of you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us leave from wherever we are. Let us leave in peace to love and to serve the Lord, to minister to one another as best we can, to be on the lookout for each other's needs, and to pray for one another as we continue on this journey.